the graphics. Um, they were excellent as you did the notices. It, it makes it so much more interesting because through the years I've heard many people give notices. On Tuesday we got a normal meeting. On <laughs> Thursday business as usual. I think, oh my, come on, there's nothing there. Uh, so that was so well done, so thank you. Delighted that Bethany and her daughter are back safely. Praise the Lord. And uh, I'm sorry I won't be able to come and hear the story next Sunday. I'm back at my old church in Welling in Kent next Sunday. Not uh, preaching, but I'll be a visitor there surprising them. I left there at the end of September, just very briefly. Uh, I'd served the Lord and I mean to continue to do so. But as a pastor, I've served for 55 years, which is quite a while. Um, but the traveling was becoming too much from Enfield to Welling. It was taken as an hour and a half, two hours to get home. By the time we came home, both Ruth and I were on our knees. And I really felt this wasn't fair to Ruth. It wasn't certainly fair to her to be concerned about me getting so tired. So I made the painful decision, and it was very painful, to leave behind almost 50 <coughs> lovely people who I love so very much. And so I've tried not to think about it too much. And at the moment I'm in between churches, shall we put it that way. People say, I hear you're retired. I say, please don't use language like that. <laughs> um, but they are one day, no doubt, but not at the moment. So we're keeping busy on the internet. Those of you on the internet, every Friday at 9 p.m. I present a music program. You'll get it on Facebook. you also get it on my website. So you can get details of that later on. And last but not least, you couldn't have given me a better subject than the subject of hope for the future. Some of you heard my story. I'm not about to give it. But uh, we have uh, recently, I say we, the royal we, uh, Ruth has revised uh, the little book of my testimony, brought it right up to date. And she has some copies today. If you've got any money left after your offering, then uh, please would you see Ruth. It's all brand new. The ink is hardly dry. Uh, she'll tell you how much. It's just covering the cost of printing. So I find happiness. And this subject is so relevant to me. I did have a listen to uh, one of the messages previously and also to a little bit of another one um, and uh, to try and get a, a flavour of where you've been. And uh, I have prepared, knowing that uh, today uh, we don't have hours and hours and hours because it's a subject that when you get into you could really spend a long time but I'm not going to do that today because I'd like you to invite me back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for the invitation today. But as I prepared I was thinking, oh my, hope for the future. If I hadn't have met Jesus on the 10th of April 1959 in a bar when I was in the army in Aldershot in Hampshire I would not be here today. I had already tried to end my life because of suicidal depression over the loss of my dad and the loss of my home. I had run away because of an abusive mother and now the loss of my fiance. It was too much loss. Couldn't take any more. I was also being bullied in the army at the time and I decided to end it all. You see, someone said you can live for 40 days without food. You can live for eight days without water. You can live for four to six minutes without air, but only seconds without hope. I believe that's true, because that's the story of my life. So I'm so grateful to the young man who was in the parachute regiment, who came into the bar, shared Jesus with me, ended up praying with me. And that night, I prayed this prayer, Oh God, if you can heal my broken heart, if you can dry my tears and give me hope, I will go to the nations of the world and tell them, of the hope you gave me. God answered my prayer and 55 plus years later thank God I'm still spreading the good news that Jesus Christ he is the hope of the world. He's your hope. He's my hope today. If you don't know him he's here. He wants to be your saviour. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your friend. The future is good. The future looks bright. Praise God I've read the end of the book. We win. We really do win. <laughs> now as I prepared this message, I struggled for quite a while, not because I didn't know what to say, but out of all that you could say, I wanted to say what God wanted me to say. Mm 
And I felt so much that he wanted me, yes, to stick with the subject, and I'll do that. But also to say some things that are going to touch your heart. I say that in faith I'll see some of you again if you're over 50, you all look too young. But uh, I'll <laughs> see you in the new year. But we don't know, do we? We don't know. We say, see you next week. We don't know. Future's in his hands. Our times are in his hands. But as I prepared, I really felt the Lord impressing on me in this message to say a few things that are going to cause you to look inside and then look to Jesus and all will be well. You know, when you hold this book in your hands, you're holding a library, don't you? You know you're holding a library. You're holding a library of 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. And it's interesting that when you turn to the prophecy of Isaiah, it has 66 chapters. I think the little things like that are interesting. I also find it interesting that when Jesus began his earthly ministry, he went to the synagogue and they handed him the scroll. And the Bible says, he found the place where it is written. In those days, it wasn't split up into chapters and verses like we have today. But he turned to the prophecy of Isaiah. And in Luke 4 and verse 18, I just visit that ever so briefly. He said, the spirit of the Lord. He was quoting from Isaiah as we know it, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. Preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Anyone fit that description today? He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. Oh, that was interesting. And the desire of my heart this morning is that I make, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I make this message really relevant to you. Not a lot of facts, not a lot of information, but I want to share something with you that I pray will be a revelation to you that your life will never be the same again. Not because you've heard Jim Patterson preach, but because you've allowed the Lord to do something new in you. Amen? Something dynamic, something new. And by way of foundation, I want to very quickly revisit Isaiah 6. You might say, but Jim, we've already done that. Yes, I know I'm Irish and... I know you've already been there, but it's just a quick revisit. It's a foundation for what I want to say later on. Firstly, the prophecy of Isaiah is given to a man who saw the Lord. And I believe that's significant. Given to a man who saw the Lord. And then the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah says, in the year... That King Uzziah, and that was his cousin, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Here was what I felt the Lord wanted me to say to you, to ask you a question really. Have you suffered the loss of a loved one? Are you still grieving? Have you suffered the loss of a friendship? A job? Maybe it's health. Maybe it's a dream. I came across a lovely verse just this week. I hadn't really noticed it before. I found it in the New Living Translation, Psalm 34, 18. And I believe it's a verse for someone here today or someone who's going to be listening to the recording. Listen to these words. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those who whose spirits are crushed. 
My word, there are so many people like that. Standing somewhere in the shadows. You'll find Jesus. He's the friend who always cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. And you'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. Now Isaiah did not just see the Lord. Second thing I want to highlight is he saw himself. You see, he saw the holiness of God. And the holiness of God lit up and exposed a dark area in his life. Isaiah 6 and verse 5, reading from the Amplified Bible. Isaiah said this, he said, woe is me. For I am undone, I'm ruined. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips, I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Unclean lips means unclean speech. Highlighted by the holiness of God. Isaiah's heart was not right before God because in the words of Jesus in Matthew 12, 34, New American Standard Bible, it says, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. How true that is. If the speech is wrong, there's a problem in the heart. I love the words of Proverbs 4 and verse 23, again from the Amplified Translation. Keep your heart and keep your heart with all vigilance. Above all that you guard, guard your heart, because out of it flow the springs of life. Amen. Thirdly, Isaiah experienced cleansing. Isaiah 6.6, 6, he talks about one of the heavenly creatures, the seraphs, flew to him and having a live coal in his hand, he snatched with the tongs this live coal from the altar and he laid it Isaiah says, he laid it on my mouth and he said, lo, this coal, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. You know, don't you, if you're a believer this morning, you're a Christian, you're born again by the Spirit of God, you know that the believer is cleansed by the precious blood of Jesus. Amen? John 14, 15. I mean 15.3. Have you ever looked at a, something and you say the opposite? <laughs> I, th I think it's something to do with being 21 plus VAT. It just happens. John 15 verse 3. It happens to the best of us. Jesus said this. He said, you are clean. Let me go back. Let me go back just one little bit. Talking about the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1 verse 7. That's where I want to go. John says, if we walk in the light, I'm sure you know it, as he is in the light, we have fellowship. We can look each other in the eye. We have fellowship one with the other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The believer is also cleansed by the word of God. And that is definitely John 15 verse 3. Jesus said this to the disciples. He said, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. In Ephesians 5.25, the Bible says, Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So a quick recap. Isaiah saw the Lord. He saw himself. He experienced cleansing. And then he heard the voice of the Lord. Isaiah 66, 6 refers to three voices. Voice of noise from the city. A voice in the temple. And a voice of the Lord. People today listen to many voices. There's a lot 
of fake news, to quote a certain famous president. <coughs> There's a lot of fake news. And I have to say quickly, often the voice in the temple is not the voice of the Lord. Why not? Because the message preached is not always preached based on the word of God. It just isn't. And the gospel so-called that's preached is not the gospel of Christ. The gospel that Paul said in Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It's not that gospel and it's not the word of God. Fake news, false preachers, false teachers and unfortunately false prophets. They ought to lay off the cheese, a lot of them, I think. <laughs> Can you visit with me briefly the Garden of Eden? When things went terribly wrong, everything was great, until Eve made a great mistake. The Bible says she listened to the wrong voice. She listened to the wrong voice. She listened to the voice of the devil. And the result was she became deceived. And the deception led to the judgment of God. And it led to her and her husband being excluded from the garden. And God asked Adam this question. He said, who told you? Who have you been listening to? And you know, friends, I don't have much time to expand this, but maybe another time. But you know, I believe we are basically what we are today because of the things we've listened to. And the people we've listened to. If you read my story, you'll see what damage was done because of the power of words in my life years ago. Who are you listening to? You listen to God, listen to the Holy Spirit, listen to the Word. Do not go far wrong because the Word of God is a lamp to our feet, it's a light to our path. Amen. Who have you been listening to? Isaiah 6 verse 8, Isaiah tells us what he heard the Lord saying. He says, I heard the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then he said, well, here am I. One translation says, here am I. Well, I do. Not too sure about that. But here I am. Here am I. I'm available. Send me. Romans 12, 1 came to mind as I read those words afresh. Amplified translation, I appeal to you, says Paul. Therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Speaking of worship, reminds us of what Isaiah said in chapter 29, verse 13. He says, the Lord said, for as much as this people, they draw near me with their mouth and with their lips they do honor me, but they've removed their heart far from me. Rebellion. Idol worship. Superficial worship. Not real. Isaiah 65 verse 1. Isaiah records the heart cry of God. God says. I, I have been sought of them. That asks not for me. And I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, here I am, God, shouting at his people, crying to his people. Here I am. Here I am. I'm not distant. I'm not far off. I'm here. I'm not remote. I'm here. He said, I said this, behold me, behold me, to a nation that was not called by my name. Then he said, I've spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walked in a way that was not good and after their own thoughts. 
You know, when I read those words, it brought to mind the words of Jesus. Matthew 23 and verse 37. It says he wept over Jerusalem. And as he wept, he said this, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, hear it, how often, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gather, gathers her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Am I speaking to someone this morning? And if you and I were just sharing together, there'd be a tear in your eye and the tissue would be out because the thing you would be sharing, the grief, the heartbreak, how you feel, what you're coping with, what you're struggling with, been going on for so long. And I wouldn't be the first person you'd shared with. It's just been going on and on and on and on. And the Lord is saying, look, listen, how often I've been beside you, I've been for you, I've been with you, I've been right there. How often would I have gathered you, hugged you, loved you, but you wouldn't let me. You, you kept me at a distance. Many of you may have heard of Jennifer Reese Lockham. And whoever's got the remote control for the clock, could you put it back just a couple of minutes? <laughs> Jennifer Reese Lockham. Mm -hmm. She spent eight years of her life in a wheelchair. She suffered from encephalitis, which damaged her central nervous system. And she says, when I first became ill, I was convinced God would heal me. I read books which said, if I prayed hard enough, praised hard enough, forgave everybody, confessed hidden sins, <coughs> and irrigated spirits of infirmity, then God was bound to heal me, but he didn't. Angry and disappointed, I turned my back on him. Then one day, she said, I was screaming my frustration at God for messing up my life. I was screaming my frustration at God as I lay in a cow pack. Cow dung. She wasn't a happy bunny. And she says, suddenly I became aware of his love completely surrounding me like an adoring parent holding a turbulent child. I don't think I ever felt so loved in all of my life. I felt the Lord saying to me, I know about the pain you're in, but I want you to let me into the center of it so I can help you. She said, I realize my resentment and distress were filling my life and slowly poisoning me. Revelation 3.20 is very well known by Christians. Do you know the setting? If you've ever been and seen the picture called Light of the World. Where Jesus is outside knocking. Have you noticed there's no handle on the outside? He can't open and go in. He's waiting. And he says in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. Hope for the future has its foundation in the solid rock of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 65 and verse 17. Behold, God says, I, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former shall not be remembered, nor will it come to mind. Jesus said once, behold, I make all things new. My question is, has he made you new? 
Have you allowed him to? Apostle Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5.17, If any man be in Christ, any woman be in Christ, what are they? They're a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. I used to smoke, I don't now. Made me cough. <coughs> I used to drink and walk sideways back to the barracks. I no longer do that. I used to not use a lot of bad language, but some, I don't do that now. He made me new, I suffered from depression. Terrible. But then Jesus changed my life, filled me with joy. I became familiar with the power of the Holy Spirit. I've never felt depressed from that day to this. Thank God. It's no secret what God can do. What he's done for this little Irishman, he can do for you. I say again, hope for the future has its foundation in the word of God. God speaks of creating a new heaven and a new earth where the former things will not be remembered or brought to mind. And verse 19, I love this. The voice of weeping shall not be heard, nor the voice of crying. A new heaven and a new earth. Go back again to the Garden of Eden. Go back to creation. Four times the Bible says when God looked at what he had created, everything was good. Then the next time he says he looked at everything and he said, you know what? Everything is very good. And sin messed it up. But Jesus died on the cross. Everyone who places their faith in him, he can become a new person. Hallelujah. But the day is coming. God says, I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And there'll be no curse there. There'll be no sorrow there. No sickness there. No tears. You won't need Kleenex. You won't need a tissue. There'll be none of that there. Oh, I love this. Revelation 21, 4 just slips in nicely. God says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to wipe all away all tears from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no mourning, no crying, nor any more pain. The former things have passed away. Isaiah 65, 20 amplified, there shall be no more in this new creation an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who dies prematurely how about this a child shall die at a hundred years of age how things are going to be changed and the animals what about the animals you're going to be able to take a lion for a walk whoopies and he won't eat you the nature of animals will be changed. Isaiah 65, 25. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. And the wolf won't look at the lamb and think, lamb chops. <laughs> All changed. All changed. All changed. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. Give me about five minutes and I'm through. Eat me even less. I have a question. Who will enjoy living in the new heaven and the new earth? Answer, God's genuine people. <laughs> people he calls servants. People who know him, love him, serve him, and obey his word. Would you agree? Yeah. And if you don't, it's right. <laughs> I have another question. Who is it that gets the Lord's attention? Who is it that gets the Lord's attention and his favor? You have it there in Isaiah 66 verse 2. To this man will I look. To this woman, God says, I will look. You want to get into God to notice you today? To shower on you his love and his favor, his mercy, his grace, his blessing. To this man, to this woman will I look. He, she that is poor and of a contrite spirit. Doesn't mean you're broke, it means you're humble. And who trembles at my word. The sinner has every right to tre tremble at the word of God because the Bible says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God Amen. and it is. Amen. 
And then the believer, the born again, the spirit filled child of God, they still tremble, but they tremble in awe at the word of God. I know some churches where they ask the congregation to stand when the word of God is read. I've never felt led to do that, but I don't say anything wrong with it. Giving such honor to the word, such a place of respect to the word. So to this man, this woman, will I look. He, she that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. The Amplified, this is the man to whom I will look and have regard. He who is humble and of a broken and a wounded spirit and who trembles at my word and reveres my commands. Hope for the future is reserved for those who know and love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.27, the Bible says Christ in you. Christ in you. Christ in you. Because you've invited him to be your saviour and Lord. Christ in you. What is he? He's the hope of glory. And lastly. Very lastly. Not lastly and then some more. But lastly, lastly. <laughs> this hope that we have as believers. Of a new heaven. A new earth. Before that. Jesus coming to the air. Coming for his bride. The believers. The dead in Christ will rise first. There they go. And we which are alive and remain. Shall be caught up together with them. Yeah. In the clouds. Yeah. In the air to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Listen. Those who have that hope. Those who have hope of living in the new heavens and the, the new earth. Listen. John says in 1 John 3.3. 3, he says, everyone who has this hope in him does something very special. What is it? Purifies himself. Have you got that hope this morning? Have you got this hope? How's your life? I said it would be personal. I said I'd be, you know, reaching your heart. I'm glad I've honored the Lord and done what I felt he did in my heart. Because these things are so important. Have you got hope for the future? That hope is based in the person of Jesus. Not in religion, but in a relationship. Amen. Christ in you.